So this week we are working on kinetics. Uh, kinetics have to do with rate of reaction. So basically with speed of reaction. So how fast or how slow the reaction happens. Um, on Monday, we talk about different things. We talk about two theories that we use in this chapter. The first one was the kinetic molecular theory. That has a lot of different components. And if you're working with gases, you spend, I don't know, almost half a lecture just talking about this theory. But for us, what we need to know is that temperature is proportional to the kinetic energy of the molecules, which means that if you increase the temperature, the molecules start moving faster. And this is important in terms of chemistry because, or I guess in terms of rate of reaction, because if we increase the temperature, that will result in like molecules moving faster. And then that will increase the number of collisions. I will also increase the energy of the collision. So by increasing temperature, they're first increasing the chances that a molecule will find another molecule to react. And you're also increasing the chances that when the molecules collide with each other, they will have enough energy to overcome the activation energy. So that's when at some point we did the graph of like energy versus reaction time. And we had, in this case, an endothermic reaction. And we talk about how this is the activation energy and this difference here between the pros and the reactant is the delta H of reaction. So for reactions to happen, you need more than just the delta H. You need a bunch of energy and the extra energy in addition to the delta H is what we call the activation energy. So we talk about the kinetic molecular theory. We also talk about collision theory. And so, sometimes people get confused and, and, and I most likely will ask you to define these theories um, on the quiz on, on the exam. And people get confused because people think that collision theory is the one that talks about number of collisions, but that's not true. Kinetic molecular theory is the one that talks about number of collisions. Collision theory talks about um, effective collisions. And it says that for a collision to be effective, you have to follow two things. First one is like um, the molecules um, need to find each other with the, uh, the right orientation. So not all the collisions are gonna be effective. Only the collisions where molecules find each other in the right orientation are going to be effective. And the second thing is that the molecules need to have enough energy when they collide so they can form protons. So that's actually a bit closer to kinetic molecular theory. But basically collision theory just tells you two things. I'm always joke about how collision theory is basically like putting Mr. Potato head together like if you have a piece of potato head and you put like the mouth and you put some eyes down there, then that's not quite Mr. Potato Head, right? You put like an ear, but then you put a shoe. They're just not the same. So you need to have each of everything in the right place. So things need to find each other in the right orientation. And then you need to be able to put things in, so you have to push them in. So you need enough energy to put the molecules in, or to put the pieces in, and you need them to put them all in the right place. So that's sort of what collision theory says. So we talk a little bit about that. Um, then we talk about how the rate of reaction
can be measured individually or can be measured in terms of one chemical. So we call that individual rates. And we talk about the rate of reaction. We measure it by doing changes in concentration divided by changes in time. Um, sometimes the rate, we call it R. Um, so if you have a reaction, let's say you have 2A plus 3B going to C plus 4D. If we have this reaction, technically we can have four different rates. We can have the rate of A, we can have the rate of B, we can have the rate of C, and we can have the rate of D. So it will be the four different individual rates, and each of them will be calculated basically the same way, which for the first one will be a change in concentration of A divided by the change in time, or B will be the change in concentration of B divided by the change in time. C will be the change in concentration of C divided by the change in time, and for D will be the change in concentration of D divided by the change in time. Um, the delta, which is what we use for change, is always final minus initial. So for reactants, the final is always gonna be less than the initial because they are reacting, right? So if we have a graph and we put concentration and we put time, technically A and B will sort of look like this when you have a really high concentration at the beginning and at the end you have a really low amount because they're just decreasing. But then C and D will look more like that where with time, the concentrations will be low, initially will be low, and with time, they will get higher. So we know that for A and B, and A and B are my reactants, the change should be negative. But when we are working with change or we're working with reaction rates, we don't want anything to be negative because I always um, compare rates to speed and you never drive at a negative speed. You either go in one way or a different direction, but you're always driving at a positive speed. So to make the rates positive, the reactants always have a negative sign in front in the equation. Sometimes I tell people that it just is also easier to just do absolute values for everything. And then you don't have to worry about which one is negative or which one is positive. Um, so you can do that, but you will see like when in the book and what's not, if you're looking at videos, um, when they write the rate of the reaction, they will do a negative when they're talking about reactants. But basically what they want you to do is to keep the value uh, positive. So we talk about this. You also talk about how to relate rates of reactions and to do basically a stoichiometry. With rates. There are two different ways you can do this. Um, the way that most people use is basically, um, let's say, Find the rate of B, C, and D if the rate of A is 0 0.150 molar over seconds. So to do this type of conversions, you can just do a, a multiple ratio. So basically use a stoichiometry to, to solve this type of problem. 
So if I know that the rate of A is 0 0.150 molar over second, and I want to find the rate of B, I can say that two A's based on the coefficients of my balanced chemical equation will produce three B's. So then that will become my rate of B. So in this case, I will basically have to take the 0.15, multiply by three, and divide it by two. So it'll be 0 0.23 molar over second. And you could technically do that for each one of them. Um, so our A, 0 0.150 molar over second. And if you wanna go for C, we know that we have two A's and produce one C. So then it will be 0.15 divided by two. So 0 0.075 molar second, that will be rate of C. And if you want to go for D, we sort of do the same thing. Um, but for D, we have two A's producing four D's. That somewhat makes sense. Um, most people do not explain, or most books or textbooks do not explain the way the ratio this way. They create a formula that is so, that is somewhat makes sense, or at least it makes sense to me. But most people don't really like it. So at some point in time, I stopped teaching it because most of my students didn't really enjoy it. But the formula basically equal all the different rates by using one over the coefficient. So I can say negative one over two, the rate of a will equal negative one over three, the rate of b, which will equal one over one, the rate of c, which will equal one over four, the rate of d. And this equation basically does the same that what we did before. Negatives are for the reactants. Um, the products stay positive. For let's say I know the rate of A. So since we already make our rate positive, we can just ignore the negative um, from the equation. So let's say that the rate of A is 0 0.15 molar per second. And we want to find the rate of D. So basically our equation will be one over two, the rate of A is gonna equal one over four, the rate of D. So then I can just plug in my number, which will be one over two, 0 0.15 equals one over four, the rate of D. So then the rate of D equals four times half times 0 0.15. One five, which is basically what we did here. You guys see that? So it's still the same idea. I found that most students find this way more confusing and find this way a lot more logical, which this is really, the first one we did is really similar to what we do when we do a stoichiometry. So it makes sense that that one actually is logical. So, you can use either whatever you guys think it makes the most sense. Good. So I'm just sort of like going really fast to everything we talked about last class. Hopefully like this helps you like remember things. And if you guys have any questions, just let me know. Good. I thought we covered a lot last class, so I wanna make sure like we cover everything and it wasn't extremely overwhelming. All right, so we talk about kinetic molecular theory, collision theory, reaction rate, rate law, rate constant. Oh, sorry, we haven't talked about that yet. Um, so the next thing with that is we start talking about the rate law.
And so I want to do it a little bit different today, hopefully seeing it two different ways, one of them will click. So let's say we have concentration and we have time. So if I have a reaction, let's pick a really simple reaction. Let's say we have peroxide breaking down into H2 and O2. So we have one reactant going to the broads. So this reaction, what's gonna happen is initially you will have a really high amount of peroxide. So I'm gonna write H2O2 initial. And then that concentration will decrease, decrease, and decrease until the concentration of peroxide sort of plateaus, which means peroxide reach equilibrium. Good? Okay. So if you are talking about the rate, the rate is a change in concentration of pero peroxide, in this case, divided by a change in time. Good? So if I'm trying to calculate rate, to calculate rate, I will basically have to do a change in concentration divided by a change in time. So here, at the beginning of the reaction, I will take this change in time, and I will take this change in concentration, and I can find the rate, good? I can do that again from maybe from here to like here, and then I can do it maybe again from here to here, and I can do it again maybe from here to here. If you guys keep, if you guys notice, early in the reaction, the rates are high because my changes in concentration are going to be really big at the beginning of the reaction, and then the changes in concentration keep decreasing. So the rate is higher at the beginning. of the reaction. Does that make sense? But then at the end, be at the beginning? Oh, sorry. Will the rate always be higher at the beginning of the reaction or does that yeah. depend? So always is always tricky. Um, for the most part, yes. And if I ask that question and you say always, I'll give you the points. There's always exceptions to things, but in general it is. Um, because at the beginning, um, it's easier for A to find B because there's a lot of them. So always at the beginning of the reaction, that 99.9% .9 of the time, <laughs> at the beginning of the reaction, the rate is going to be higher because there's higher concentration, so there's going to be higher changes in concentration. At the end, when the reaction reaches equilibrium, the rate is just about zero because there's barely any change in concentration. There is some, but not enough. So you will see that I can say that the rate of the reaction, I can say it's proportional. That means proportional to the concentration of the reactants. Does that make sense? So if I'm trying to make an equation, so if I'm trying to write um, a rate equation, I can say that R is proportional in this case to the concentration of peroxide. Good? So they are almost equal, but not quite. To make this equation equal, um, what we do is we make that equation equal and we multiply by a proportionality constant, which is what we call the rate constant. Okay, so that's where actually k comes from, is to be able to make this the same. 
good. And for some reason in chemistry, every time you have a constant, we call it K. So this is the beginning of the rate law. The rate law starts just trying to make an equation to calculate the rate of reaction at any time. That's what the rate law is trying to do. It's trying to measure the speed of the reaction at any time. So when we took this equation and we did experiments, we learned that the, this equation only works sometimes. Some chemicals follow that equation, some chemicals do not. So with some exper experiments, they, not, they learn that some chemicals have different effects on the rate than others. So that's when they start adding, I'm gonna put M here, which are actually called the orders. And the orders just basically describe Um, the magnitude of the effect of changing concentrations on the rate. So those exponents just came because we initially thought that R will equal K times the concentration will give us our rate. Like that was just ideal. However, sometimes changing concentrations of one thing will actually have a bigger or lesser effect than others. Good? And this is sort of like the example. So let's say I have my peroxide reaction going to O2 and H2. And I know that R will equal K times the concentration of peroxide. And let's say that when the concentration of peroxide was one molar, I calculated my rate, so I measured my rate, and my rate was two molar per second, good? So what I did basically was, I made a one molar solution of peroxide, and I calculated how fast the reaction was happening. I calculated my changing, my changing concentration divided by my changing time. It gave me a two, good? So then I took the concentration of peroxide, and I made it two molar. So I just increased my concentration to see how concentration would affect my rate, good? Then I found, calculated my rate again, and what I noticed was that the rate was four molar per second. Good? So I double the concentration of peroxide and that double the rate. Do you guys see that? Which means that this and this one, the relationship between the two is a one. Meaning whatever I do to my concentration, that would do the same thing to my rate. So technically, if I take my concentration of peroxide and I increase it by eight, then my rate should be 16 molar per second. Good? Because I met it a times higher, so that will be A times higher, good? And some chemicals behave like that, and that's what the number one represents. Other chemicals do not behave like that. Actually. Let's say I went from one molar to two molar, and then my rate became eight 
So it didn't go from two to four, it went over two to eight. So what happened here? I went from here to here, so I double my concentration, right? But when, when I look at my rate, what happened to my rate? Quadruple. Does that make sense? Then I went from one to eight. And then it went to 32. I think that number is right. We'll see. <laughs> Anyways, um, so the idea is that to find the exponent, whatever exponent you got in there, let me use back to M. What you do is like you actually change the concentration and you will see how the, shape, the rate changes. And you guys should sort of know how to analyze these things. So that's what we do when we analyze using initial rates. So I'm going to erase the last step. I'm going to use the first step. So basically the exponents or the order just tell you the magnitude um, of the change or the effects that changes the concentration has on the rate. So if you have a problem like this, where like you want to figure out what the exponent actually is, I was sort of guessing, looking at numbers and telling you, oh, this doubles, this quadruples. In general, we can do what we did before, which is calculating uh, the rate law using the initial rates. To find initial rates, you basically take the ratio of the two different trials. So we have one trial and two trials here. And you'll see that the rate law is R equals K times the concentration of peroxide to some power. So for trial one, my rate was two molar per second. And that will equal K times my concentration of peroxide, which is H2O2 to some exponent. Then I can pick my trial two, which was in this case, eight molar per second. That will equal K times the concentration of H2O2 to the M. I actually know my concentrations, so I can erase this and put my concentration values. For the first one, the concentration was one molar. For the second one, the concentration was two molar. So I can take the ratio of the two, and that will be two divided by eight, that is one fourth, will equal K divided by K, it cancels out, and then that will be one to the M divided by two to the M. So one divided by four is 0.25, that will equal 0 0.5 to the M. Good? And you can make it as a fraction, or you could do this. And if you do it as a, as, as a fraction, not as a decimal, um, you can see that in order for this half to become one fourth, that M has to be two. Because one half square will be one fourth. If that doesn't make any sense, it's not a big deal. You can do it the second way um, with decimals. And then we talk about how A equals BX, then X will equal the natural log of A divided by the natural log of B. So then M should be the natural log of 0.25 divided by the natural log of 0.5. And if you put plug that into your calculator, so natural log of 0.25 divided by the natural log of 0.5, that gives you a two. So I went through more than what I wanted to go at this point, but um, the idea was that we wanted to find the rate an equation to describe the speed of the reaction at any time. Because we know that the speed of the reaction 
will change with concentration. That's what the graph keeps changing. So in order to do that, we make an equation that was the rate will equal some sort of constant, which we call K, times the concentration of the reactants. After doing experiments, we learned that not all reactants behave the same way. And some of them had different effects on the rate. So in order to fix or accommodate for that, we added to the equation the exponent, which we call orders. And each chemical has their own order. <clears throat> and the orders, while they are somewhat related to the coefficients, they don't always match the coefficients. So we can't really use the coefficients as the orders. Instead, these orders are determined experimentally. They are experimental values. And what they do is they show how changes in concentrations affect the rate of the reaction. Does that make sense? And you can have different effects. Um, some of them might not make any change. Like I change the concentration of something and that doesn't do anything to my rate. This actually summarizes. So order rate. So I, let's say I say I double my concentration and no change. So let's say I double my concentration. There's no change in my rate. That means it's zero. That means that the change is elevated to the zero. If I double the concentration and that doubles my rate, that means it's first. And if I double the concentration and it quadruples, that means it's second. And you can keep doing that. Does that make sense? So, so like if you, if you double the concentration and it triples, would it be like to the 1.5? Yeah, but like most of the time, like so in real life, um, the exponents or the orders can be any number. It could be negative, it could be positive, it could be fractions, it could be anything. So for this class, I'm gonna keep them as whole numbers so you would not see that. You could in real life, but like in this class, the other thing would be like, if you double and, if it, and it like goes eight times faster, then it's to the third order and so on. So even, so when you're doing problems, if you get like a 1.7, just round it to two. So keep everything rounded to like one whole number, to the closest whole number. Good question. This sort of makes sense, how these things work. Those are the hardest things to explain because it's just an experimental observation. So then they became part of our rate laws. So which takes us to rate laws, even though we already wrote this. Let's say we have the reaction that is 2A plus 3B going to C and 4D. If we need to write the rate law for the reaction, we have the R, which is the rate, equals K, which is the rate constant, times the concentration of A times the concentration of B. One of them elevated to the M and one of them elevated to the N. Those two are the orders and their experimental values.
not the provisions. And then these two are the concentrations of reactants and they are all molar concentrations. So that's what the ray law sort of looks like. Um, we talk sometimes about the overall order and the overall order is just the sum of the orders, which most of the time I write M and plus N, but if you have three reactants, then you have three different orders. So you have to add them all together. If you have one reactant, then it's just be the one number, good? Okay, so this is basically how the ray law looks like. Um, most of the problems that you would get in this part have to do with finding the rate law of a reaction. So to find the rate law, you have to do two things. You need to find the orders and two, you need to find the K value. So you will see a bunch of problems are asked. You just find the rate law for the following reaction. And basically what they're asking you to do is to find the order, so the value of M and N. and to find the K value. K values for the most part are fairly easy to find. The ones that are a little bit harder to find are going to be the orders M and N. And there are different ways you can do that. The first way you can do it is by using the initial rates experiment. And when I wanna, I'm going to write next to it, um, table, because that's what most of you will remember it. So to do the initial rate experiments is basically when you got the table and you pick two trials, you guys know what I'm talking about? Maybe, maybe not, <laughs> okay. Um, initial rates is basically doing something like this, where you take two different trials and you find the rate. So I'm going to make one problem up here so we can do initial rates. Okay, so let's say you have a problem that says find the rate law of 
for the following reaction. Um, so they give you this table and they give you the reaction. So we know that the rate law is gonna be R equals K times the concentration of A to some exponent times the concentration of B to a different exponent. So we know the backbone of our rate, but to actually find the rate law, we need the values of M and N, and we also need the value of K. Okay? So you're gonna use that table to find M and N and K. And this is what we call initial rates. Good? You don't need to really worry about what we call them initial rates, but this is, this is just what it is. Um, so every time I'm referring to initial rates, this is what I want you guys to do. Just use the table and find. Um, so we have to find M and N, and that's the first thing you do. To find M, You need to find two trials where B stays the same, but A changes. Good? So I look at this, and if I pick trial one and trial two, that will actually work because B stays the same, but A changes in concentration. Does that make sense? And then the second thing you're going to do is take the ratio. Oh, when, I'm, when I say take the ratio, it just basically means take one and divide it by the other one of the two trials. So what we need to do is just take the ratio of the two trials. So I'm gonna do one divided by two. So I'm gonna write try one divided by try, try two. And I'm gonna plug in all the information I know on each of the rate laws. So for the first one, my rate was 0 0.300 molar over seconds. And that was going to equal K times the concentration of A times the concentration of B. <laughs> I'll do the same thing for trial two. You get 0 0.6, 0, 0 equals K times 0 0.2 times 0 0.2. What I said is we should take the ratio. So I'm gonna divide the two. That will be taking the ratio. And then I'm gonna to try to solve this. So if I solve this, I know that 0.3 divided by 0.6 is 0 0.5 molar per second. Actually, the molar per second cancels out. It's only 0 0.5. That equal, case cancel out. But then I have 0 0.1 divided by 0 0.2 each of them to the M, and then times 0.2 to the N divided by 0.2 to the, to the N. I don't know what N is, but they should be the same, so that will cancel out. So then I keep solving this, and I have 0 0.5 equals 0 0.5 to the M, which means that M has to be one. Does that make sense? So that is how you find the M value. If you didn't know this, you know that you can do a natural log of 0.5 divided by natural log of 0.5 to get the M value. Then we basically have to do the same thing to find to find N. So to find And you need to find two trials where A 
stays the same and B changes. So A stays the same and B changes, that will be one and three. Does that make sense? One and three has A being point 0.1 and B point 0.2 and point 0.4. So that will work. So then I take trial one divided by trial three. If we do that, we just plug in the information 0 0.300 0, 0, um, divided by 1.200 0, 0, equals case that will cancel out 0 0.1 to the M, 0 0.1 to the M that will also cancel out. And then we have 0 0.2 to the N divided by 0 0.4 to the N. So all of that is there. So to find n, we ended up having that this is 0.3. So one divided by four will equal one divided by two to the n. So then that means that n equals two. And if you didn't know that, you know that n will equal the natural log of one divided by four divided by the natural log of one divided by two. So with all that information, <clears throat> now we know that R will equal K times the concentration of A to the first power times the concentration of B to the second power. And if you wanna find K, which is the last thing we need to do, we just need to pick one trial and plug in all the information and solve for K. So it's gonna pick that trial because I can just see it. My table is so far away up. So the R was 0 0.300 molar over seconds. That will equal K times A, which is 0.1 molar to the first power, times B, which is 0 0.2 molar to the second power. So then K will, e, will be 0 0.3, 0 molar over, molar over second times 0 0.1 molar times 0 0.2 molar squared. So this is 75. Good. And some cases are gonna be super tiny, some cases are gonna be super gigantic. So don't be scared of like whatever K value is, because K values range from really, really, really small to really, really, really big. So then we need to pick the units. So the units are, we have a molar and two more molar. So we have three molar at the bottom, but one molar on top. So it'll be M to the negative two because one molar will cancel out with the other molar. But then you get two extra ones. And then that will be times seconds to the minus one because you got that seconds at the end. And that's how you use initial rates to find the rate law. Yeah. I think you're muted. Okay, so now, um, do you guys have any questions about anything we covered so far? Okay, so <laughs> let's keep working on um, finding orders. So 
the main way to find orders is by using initial rates. Um, we just covered that. Um, there's a few other ways you can do this uh, or find orders. Second way is by graphical analysis. And the third one is by reaction mechanisms. There is technically a fourth one, and it's by using the K units. Oh, and we will talk about this later. But it's not a real way to do it, it's just sometimes based on the K units, you can sort of figure out what order it is. But that is not a real thing. Anyways, so we're gonna move to the next second one, which is graphical analysis. So, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about where these things come from, but in general, let's say um, I have a rate law that is first order. And my reaction is, I'm going back to my peroxide reaction. If the rate law is first order, that means that R will equal K times the concentration of A to the first power. If I do magic, because we science scientists are magicians and we can just do magic, I can take this equation, break it down into change in concentration divided by change in time equals K times concentration of A and reorganize it as something like this. Anyways. We do magic and at the end, we do something called integral and we do the integration of this thing. It's a thing that you learn when you take calculus, basically magic. And then that becomes this. How magic. So, let's erase all of this. And technically, we can do that for every order. So we can do zero order, that we R equals K A to the zero, and magic can happen, and gender having A T equals negative K T plus A zero. We can have second order. So these are what we call the rate laws. Um, the first. And the last ones 
are what we call the integrated laws. So there is some sort of like integration happening. Happening in between the two. So you don't really need to understand like why we integrate them or anything like that. The idea is that when you have the rate loss, the rate loss study the speed of the reaction. But sometimes we actually want to know um, the relationship between time and amount. And the integrated laws allow us to find the relationship between some sort of time because T in this thing is time and concentration because AT is the concentration at a given time. <clears throat> so at some point, people try to use uh, kinetics to actually be able to find um, how much of something you will have after 10 or 20 minutes, something like that. So they wanted to be able to relate how much you have of something with the amount of time you have to wait for the reaction to happen. Um, and they learned that by doing the integrals for the rate loss, they can get equations that will relate time and amount. Good? And at some point we'll work on like using these equations to relate time and amount. But right now, what I want to use them for is to use them to find the orders. So we have these three equations and they all sort of follow the same format, which is they have some sort of variable at the beginning. They have a constant in the middle times another variable plus the initial, which is technically a constant. So they all follow the y equals mx plus b equation. And this is the equation for some sort of line. Good? So they all that have this type of format. And we can use this to identify the order of the each reaction by some by doing some sort of graphical analysis. So if the reactant is zero order, so I'm gonna keep them all straight next to each other. Um, concentration versus time should be a straight line. Because it will be y versus x should be a straight line. And for zero, my y is my concentration and my x is my time. So for first order, natural log of concentration should be my y versus time will be my x, should give me a straight line. And for the last one, one over concentration should be my y versus time to give me a straight line. So this is how you use this, which I'm assuming for most people this is sort of confusing. So let's say
have this reaction. So I give a reaction, um, and they're asking you to use graphical analysis to identify the react the order for each of the reactions. So basically, to find the orders, what you need to do is you have to create a few graphs. And for this class, you don't really have to make graphs, so you will just have to analyze the graphs. So I will just give you the graphs. So let's say this is what you have. You have a graph of concentration versus time. You have a graph of natural local concentration versus time. You have a graph of one over concentration versus time. And why are we using the, those three concentration, natural log and one over concentration my, as my y axis? Because if I look back, I know that zero should be concentration, one should be natural log of concentration, and two should be one over concentration. So those are the three options I have for my zero, first, and second. So basically my first one is like the zero order equation. The second one will be my first order equation. And the one over should be my second order equation. All right, so I'm actually going to start erasing these letters. And we're just gonna do them in different colors so we can keep track of them. Sorry if any of you are colorblind, because I'm color coding everything. So if you're colorblind, it's gonna be hard for you to see it. So if you have problems with colors, just let me know. Okay, so A, what happened was I plotted A for the first graph and it gave me a curve. It did not give me a straight line. What does that mean? It means that A is not zero order. Then I tried to plot the natural log concentration of A um, versus time and it gave me something like this. which then means that A is first order. If I plot A in the, my third graph, it should give me something like that, which is not a straight line, which means it's not second order. Then we should be able to plot B. Let's say we plot B and B gives you a these results. So based on these results, that will mean that B is zero order because that's the one that gave you the straight line. Then we can plot C. Let's say C gave you these results. That means that C is also first order. And let's say we plot D, and D gives you these results. Then that means that D is second order. So basically you get the three graphs and you're trying to figure out which of the graphs gives you the straight line, 
whichever graph gives you the straight line, that will tell you the order of each of the chemicals. So based on this, my rate law should be R equals K times A to the first power times B to the zero power times C to the first power times D to the second power. Good. So in general, you don't have to make the graphs. I'll give you the graphs. But based on the graphs, you should be able to tell me um, what order that compound is. Sometimes I give you the graphs, and other times I might not actually give you the actual, actual graph. I might just tell you what graph gives you the straight line. So I can say, what is the order of A if a graph of concentration versus time gives you a straight line. So since the graph is concentration versus time, that means concentration versus time, the order is going to be zero. So sometimes you get the actual, actual graphs, other times I just wanna tell you the axis of the graph that gives you the straight line. <coughs> that either way should be enough information to know the order of the reaction. I'm going back to here, that is how you do graphical analysis. The third one is reaction mechanisms, but we won't do that today, we will do that next Monday, because reaction mechanisms just take a little bit of time. And now that we have been talking about integrated laws, let's spend a little bit more time about integrated laws. Now first compare them to rate laws. So if the rate law is R equals K times A to the zero, the integrated law is going to be concentration equals KT plus in the initial concentration. So if R equals K times A, the first power can be a natural log of AT equals negative KT plus natural log of A zero. And R equals K. So these are the rate laws and the integrated rate laws. The rate laws have to do with speed. So they have to do with rate, the speed of the reactions. And the integrated laws relate concentration with time. So if the question is asking you about how long it's gonna take for something to happen or how much of something you're going to have after X amount of time, you're working with integrated laws. Integrate, integrated laws are the ones that relate concentration or amount to something else. Rate laws only focus on speed. It's only about how fast or how slow something is happening. So that is like the main distinction between the two. So there's another set of equations I'm trying to find them. Um, there are called the half-life equations. And the half-life equations, what they do is, if they tell you how long it takes for something to decrease by half. It's the amount of time it takes for the concentration of something to decrease by half. They're basically the same equations and the, as the integrated law equations. They're basically the same, um, but just solve. So they become a little bit easier to use. So we will do one of them. Um, I'm gonna write them down first, and then we're gonna do one problem to show that the integrated laws and the half-lives 
are basically the same equations. So I'm gonna write them here. So the normal is that we want half. Um, t, the half is not a real value. It's just t half representing that half life equation. For a zero order equation is this. For the first order equation is this. And you will see that sometimes we write 0 0.693 divided by k. Because the natural log of two, if you put it on the calculator, it gives you 0 So we're gonna do one problem. So um, using the zero order equation, find the time it takes for the concentration of A to decrease by, by two. So at the end, you're gonna have half. So in this problem, it tells you to use the zero order equation. So we have that AT equals negative KT plus A zero. Something to notice is that the integ integrated laws, the zero order is negative, the first order is negative, but the second order is positive. So just keep that in mind. That is not a typo. That third one is positive. And if you don't believe me, you can do the integral. Um, just be careful with that. Okay, so let's say we wanna figure out the amount of time it takes for the concentration to decrease by half using the zero order equation. So that means that initially, Um, we had a zero, and then at the end, we had to have half of a zero. Does that make sense? Because that would be the amount of time that increased by half. So initially, you have a, and at the end, I have half of a. So I'm gonna use this. I'm gonna plot that into my equation. So I'm gonna have half a zero equals negative kt plus a zero. So then I can move this that way and that that way. And if I do that, then I have KT will equal A zero minus half A zero. Make sense? So then I have KT will equal half A zero. And then if I divide by K on each side, I'll end up having that T equals half A zero divided by K, which is the same as me writing A zero divided by two K. Does that make sense? So what I, what I'm, why I'm, the reason I'm doing this is because now you can see that this, this equation is literally the same as this equation. So the half-lives are nothing new. They just like solve them so you, you can use them fast to know like how long it takes for something to decrease by half. This is really common and we use the amount of time 
that it takes to decrease by half. We use that system a lot when we talk about nuclear chemistry. Like if you ever go to take some sort of like, I don't know, X-ray or something like that. And then if you ask them about the isotopes or like the radioactivity samples they use, they will say what it is and they will tell you the half-life. Like just a really common term. And we use the equations a lot in the next chapter. So I just wanted you to know where the half-life equations come from. Does that make sense? So they just took the integrated laws and figure out if the initial is this number, how long it takes for that number to decrease by two. And they ended up with those equations. So they, these half-life equations are basically the same as the integrated law equations. So for integrated laws, you basically need to be able to use them. <coughs> and we did some problems last time. So let me go to my notes and find a problem we can do with integrated laws just so we can practice. Actually, let's go to the homework problems and we can actually then some, do some homework problems also. Get some problems done from the homework. Okay, so we got some practice problems from the homework. This is practice problem 28. Um, it has part A and part B. So they say the rate constant for the reaction and that question mark should be an error to A going to B is 7.5 times 10 to negative three seconds to the minus one. The reaction is first order. So they tell you what the rate order is. So you know that you have to use the, the first order equations. Good. Something to be really careful is that I could actually give you this problem without that information. And you still should be able to know what order to use because, and didn't mean to move this. Um, because last time we talked about this, about the K units. So the K units can tell you what order to use. If the order is zero, the units are molar per second for K. If the order is first, the units of K are the seconds to the minus one. And if the order is second, the units are M minus one, S minus one. So based on the K units, you can also know or figure out what order the compound is. So if you didn't have that, you can see how the K units are S to the minus one. So that will also tell you that the reaction is first order. Does that make sense? So the question is how long in seconds will it take for the concentration of H to decrease? So they're asking you for how long, which means that you have to work with the integrated law because the integrated law are the only ones that have time in them, good? So I know it's first order. And I'm gonna actually go the long way. So I'm like, oh, it's first order. So I know that R equals K 
k times a to the first power, I also know that the natural log of a t equals negative k t plus the natural log of a zero. And I also know that t half equals natural log of two divided by k. So from first order, those are all the equations I know. And I'm doing it this long way just because when you guys are doing these problems at home by yourself, you have all these options and you need to figure out which one to use. So when I read the problem, then I see that it's asking me for how long. So I know this one, the initial rates, sorry, the rate law doesn't have how long. Then it's either between the second one and the third one. But this is only the third one. It's only applicable for like half lives, meaning only applicable when you want to decrease by half. So then this one doesn't quite work either because the amount is not half. Does that make sense? If it was from the initial, the like initial was 1.25 and the final was 0.625, so like literally half, then you could use this equation. But this equation only works when the concentrations are like one, like half of the other. Good? So then we have to use my integrated law equation. So then we start to plug in our information. My final is the 0.71, so it will be natural log of 0.71 equals negative k, which is 7.5 times 10 to the negative 3, seconds to the minus 1 times the time, which I don't know, that's what I'm looking for, plus the natural log of my initial, which is 1.25. So then we'll have to start solving. So log of 0.71, it's negative 0 0.34 equals negative 7.5 times 10 to negative three. And then natural log of 1.25, we plus 0 0.223. So I can move things to the side. So I can do 7.5 times 10 to the negative 3 t equals 0 0.223 plus 0 0.34. So 7.5 times 10 to the other 3t equals 0 0.566. And then I have to divide that by that. So t equals 75.4 seconds. Make sense? So that is basically how to solve um, A. Then for B, they're asking you for the same reaction. And instead, they're asking you for how much you will have after two minutes. Good? So they're still asking you a relationship between amount and time. So we are still gonna be using the same equation. So I have the natural log of AT equals negative KT plus the natural log of A zero. And I like using the first order because I feel like out of all of them, the first order is the hardest one because we have to use natural log with them. The zero order and the second order are a little bit easier because there's no natural logs. Um, so we got all of that. Uh -huh. We know K, 7.5 times 10 to the negative three. We know T, but this is in seconds, but and this in minutes. So we have to change the minutes to seconds. So two minutes, and in one minute, you got 60 seconds. So then that will be 120 seconds. So I'm gonna write 120 seconds. Plus the natural log of my initial, which is 2.25, then we natural log of my final, which I don't know. So then my natural log of my final is going to be all that. 
So negative 7.5 e to the negative 3 times 120 plus the log of 2.25. So negative 0 0.089. Well, that is the natural log of x, so I have to remove natural log, so I have to divide, like elevate to the e, which then will make my value be 0 0.91. Molar. So then that will be my final answer. Good. And that is how we use the integrated laws. So so far we should be good at this, so we know all these theories and the right constants and what's not. We know how to um, do the real reaction um, using a stoichiometry. You should be able to calculate problems with rate laws. We haven't done any of that, any, but when you do the homework, you should be able to. It's more like just using the equation and plug and chug. Um, we, do, we know how to do graphical analysis and we know how to use initial rates. We have not talked about mechanisms, which means that we haven't done objective five or objective six. Um, you should be able to use the rate laws to do calculations, sort of what we need, just using the integrated laws. And half-life, we can do some problems, but basically just using the half-life equations. So for the most part, we just need some more practice on integrated laws and cover the things that have to do with reaction mechanisms. So what we're gonna do on Monday is we're gonna just go over reaction mechanisms. And then the rest of the time, we will practice other things. Mostly just integrated laws. Integrated laws are really important because the integrated laws are gonna carry over to nuclear chemistry. So nuclear chemistry, like the second half of nuclear chemistry is all about integrated laws, which are the same as kinetics. So there's a few things in nuclear chemistry that are going to be literally the same as what we're doing in kinetics. So hopefully that helps. So for the questions, um, the answer is yes, because um, for the first one, because I will write a question, but I will only give you the information I want you to use. So I'll give you a problem and I say find the rate orders using these graphs. So I would not give you initial rates and I would not give you K units or anything. I would just give you graphs. So that would be the only thing you have to answer them. I can do the same thing with like a reaction mechanism. And I can do the same thing with the initial rates. So the problems will be specific, right? They will only give you the information I want you to use. Hopefully that makes sense for the first question. So you have to sort of know them all. And is the homework still due Friday? The answer is yes, but it's due next Friday. Because the quiz is due next Friday. So the quiz, the homework, and everything is due next Friday. This week, what is due is the lab, the battery lab, and the design for the special project. So in general, this should be a sort of light week. Still, I would recommend you to use it wisely, and meaning like just get like at least half or maybe more than half the homework done. So the next week, you don't have that much to study from. 